Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Great Leadership. My guest today, Matt Higgins, he's the co-founder and CEO of private investment firm RSC Ventures that has a large portfolio of brands, including one that you might be familiar with, Magnolia Bakery. He's also the executive fellow at the Harvard Business School. He has been a guest on the Emmy award-winning show Shark Tank. And he's also the author of a best-selling book called Burn the Boats, Toss Plan B Overboard and Unleash Your Full Potential. Matt, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. Uh, I have a lot of business questions for you, but I always like to jump in with some of the personal stuff first so that people can get to know a little bit more about you. Um, so what's your origin story? How did you get involved with a lot of the stuff that you're doing? I understand that your mom has been a very profound influence on you with this concept of burn the boats. So maybe you could share that story. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think the most important thing to first know about me is, uh, is upbringing. It's probably true about everybody. But uh, the lens through which I saw the world as a kid was poverty, abject poverty, desperation, and, uh, and education as the pathway out of it. And uh, I grew up in Queens, New York, selling flowers on street corners and uh, selling handbags at flea markets from a young age, working at McDonald's, scraping gum under wow. tables, like a, a lot of... Yeah, a lot of, and again, I don't say like poor me. I'm just giving you the context of the dysfunction. Like I started those jobs. I started selling flowers when I was 10 uh, and uh, and scalping tickets back then. Now it's legal. We didn't have StubHub. So he used to wait online all night at a, at a venue in order to get tickets and then somebody would pay you for doing it. But um, so that was it. My mother, uh, brilliant woman, but uh, divorced when I was young and had a ton of health problems that were sort of uh, so vague but compiling chronic uh, and there wasn't much anyone could ever quite do about it. And so a lot of uh, early childhood was both helping to provide for the family, uh, watching her slowly succumb and, uh, and me desperate to find a way out of it. So fortunately God gave me a gift of being very defiant, never felt like the circumstances I was born into were going to dictate the end. And uh, when I, at my lowest moment, came up with a life hack, which also is the purpose of this book, which um, was my mother had gotten a GED as an adult. Okay. And I watched her uh, and for her education was salvation for her self-respect. And I watched her light up going to get a GED and then going to enroll at Queens College. And uh, I came up with an idea where I was like, well, could I just drop out on purpose and use the GED to get me to college early? So why did that matter? One, mm. it was um, freedom from the rigidity of the structure. Uh, and I talk about edge case a lot, which we can get into, but freedom from the rigidity of the structure of, of high school wasn't working. And two, by being a college student, I would be able to uh, increase my earning power very quickly. So when I was 16, made the radical decision to drop out of high school, get my GD and enroll in college. And that single decision, uh, and I could talk about burn to boats ties into that, changed the entire trajectory of my life. Best decision I ever made, hands down. Why? Uh, so why? Because a lot of people listening might say, I mean, yeah, I mean, it sounds like a seemingly innocent and innocuous choice, right? I mean, drop out of high school, take the GED, get to college a little bit earlier. Why is it that that thing set you up on this different trajectory? So many, that's such a good question. So many different ways to look at it. So let me break it down. Why? Well, one, technically, I felt like my mother was going to slip away and I needed to, to to achieve wealth as soon as possible. So I hacked into something inadvertently. This is a little bit of hindsight bias, right? I'm putting language to things that I was sort of doing intuitively. But by, by dropping out of high school at 16, starting college, I pulled forward my professional career by two years and combine that with the degree of desperation, mm. I was able to achieve things very early. So compounding, which applies as much to, to professional success as it does to money, if not more, money might be the byproduct of compounding, right? Yeah. But uh, I was able to pull everything forward. So to crystallize that, I went from a high school dropout at 16, making 375 at McDonald's or working at a deli, making five bucks, to $100,000 a year as the mayor's press secretary by the time I was 26. So if you look at the Kager of that of that growth, you know, 375 five bucks an hour to 100 grand a year at age 26, you know, it's pretty extraordinary. And so that was number one. But probably even um, as impactful and more important was in order to pull off such a radical decision, I had to do a few things. One, I had to tap into my internal navigation system and trust my instincts against the whole weight of conventional wisdom that was telling me I was going to be a loser forever. You have guidance counselors, teachers, everyone, and they were not wrong, 
concluding, if you make this one decision, you will ever never overcome the stink of failure. This is before Mark Zuckerberg, you know, made it cool to drop out of things. And like back then, it seemed like you're gonna be a failure. And so I had to overcome the weight of all that conventional wisdom. And I had to understand that I was an edge case, not a base case, an edge case in which the system was not set up to work for me. And I had to create a new template. And why that was so important is I had to trust my intuition and I had to make the decision in spite of, not with the support of. And I and I had to self-sabotage. This is where burn the boats comes from. Mm. In order, in order, this part is not hindsight bias. I did this very consciously. I was so tired of the interventions from people saying like, oh, you're so smart, Matt. You just went to this, you know, school when you were young. You took your SAT when you were seven, you know, in, in seventh grade, you know, all this stuff. Like, what a shame. And they had no idea that my mother was literally wasting away in the next room. And my intuition told me she was not going to make it. And also nobody gives a shit anyway about my life. And so because they didn't have visibility into my world, I was like, how do I get people to stop intervening and just shut the F up and let me do what I'm meant to do? By f and I decided I would fail every single class. That was my burn the boats. People think of dropping out of high school was the burn the boats move. Actually, self-sabotage was my burn the boats you, move. You purposely failed I every made class? Every single class, and it sounds like I'm being cute, but it is true, except for typing, because uh, that was the one useful thing I could discern from high school. And I'll still stand by that. Everything else was, I haven't used algebra since, but uh, I dropped out of high school, wow. but I failed everything and I burned the boats so that I would give myself no option of retreat. Think about how hard it is for a little kid who's already depressed, mildly self-destructive, because I'm so sad and no, and feeling completely alone in the world. And I got to stick to this crazy decision when everyone is intervening and feels a sense of loss, pity, yeah. derision, right? And then maybe made fun of by your other fellow students and stuff like that, right? How do I stick with it? And then that's when I, mm. I gave myself no return. And uh, the story ends that I drop out, I enroll in Queens College, I uh, you know get a three four three five the first year, and I come back to my prom as like Maximus, you know, in the Coliseum, like. You know, uh, how do you like them apples? I'm mixing movies up. <laughs> but like, and then the look at my, I maybe, I believe this happened. So you know how you reconstruct things yes, you've told yes, so yes, many yes. times? I really swear to God, I, I think this happened. I remember seeing my guidance counselor, Mr. Rosenthal, Ms. Vega, Dr. King, who was my gym teacher. Like, there, I remember all of them. And the look of pity or slight derision had gone from one of begrudging respect, or in some cases, love. You know, Mrs. Vega was a great teacher. So, mm -hmm. Uh, the burn the boats, everything about my life philosophy can be condensed down to that one year, you know, and what it took to make that decision and what happened as a result. Yeah, and no, I, I love that. And I also really like that you never saw yourself as a victim. You didn't like that kind of pity, woe is me mentality, which is something I have two young kids, a seven year old and a soon to be, well, he just turned three. But sometimes they, you know, kids can fall into that pity, like I'm upset, feel sorry for me. And I always try to tell them, you know, I'm, I'm not going to feel sorry for you. You have to work hard. If you want something, you have to go out and get it. You somehow figure that out at a very young age. You were, like you said, selling flowers on the street corner, scalping tickets, and you never wanted anybody to pity you. But it seems like fast forward to today, the kind of victim mentality inside of a lot of organizations or the I don't know. It almost feels like people don't want to work as hard or do as much anymore. I don't know if you would agree with that, but it feels like some of that ethic and some of that drive or motivation or passion, especially when it comes to work, has disappeared a little bit. Do you see that at all? Uh, I say yes, but I think even a bigger problem is that I do feel like there's a hustle being run and a myth being per perpetrated on on onto a large part of our population where we're being told that you are being victimized and that you should somehow be make this part of your identity and you've been aggrieved and and and, uh, and I'm not talking about where areas where that's actually true and legitimate I'm just talking about culturally generally that that we we've come to believe that the victim narrative is is not if not ideal at least a viable path yeah and in my experience, there's a big difference between having been victimized in an incident, treated poorly, treated wrongly, uh, versus assuming that as part of your identity in perpetuity, right? Yeah. And so for me, I would have this debate with my mom because my mom felt 
she was victimized horrendously in ways that I didn't know as a child. But um, but she chose to make that her identity. And we'd have these debates and a crucial moment. Fortunately, I was present enough to know that the way I was growing up was was wrong and that it was going to leave a, a significant mark. And the way to deal with it would be to resist in the moment. Like, I think if you don't resist in a moment, it's even harder to overcome yeah. the trauma that happens to you. But I have these debates with her like, mom, like. I don't see the world that way. Like, I don't want to believe that I am destined to be a victim. So from now on, I happen to things. Things no longer happen to me. And I remember this debate we had. She was like, easy for you to say when you're not dying. And I was like, well, everyone's dying. I think I actually technically am. You just might have a head start. We would have these conversations, you know, little wise ass punk kid. But back to today, we are perpetuating a myth. It's like fool's gold, right? If you if you adopt this mindset that you're being victimized, the 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 the, the version of compensation you seek will come to you. But it's yeah. not true. It's a lie. And I find people who perpetuate that are usually using it as a means to uh, manipulate, right? And so, yeah, yeah. I, I, I weirdly I feel bad for people all the time, which is it's funny because I deny myself the ability to ever see myself as a victim. And yet my wife always makes this point, yet you see others that way. You always feel so bad, you know, even when people make their own bad decisions. But that's a whole separate issue, probably yeah, a separate podcast. Yeah, and it's funny. It's <laughs> it's really applicable, I think, in the work setting, too. I mean, there, there are a lot of, like, trending. I don't know if you've seen any of these. There are these trending. Lazy girl, right? Isn't yeah, yeah. One? That's exactly <laughs> where I was going to go. The, the lazy girl uh, jobs. There was another trend on, like, um, something for Mondays, like, take it easy Mondays, uh, loud quitting. And it's just even I feel the worst about those. Yeah, those it's, it's are insane. like, oh, man, one person's quiet quitting is your colleague's future promotion. I mean, like the first people that will be uh, will be uh, zapped, unfortunately, are going to be those. You're just making it easier for your employer to figure out how to trim the budget when unemployment ticks up in a few months. Yeah. And then I think we see this in a lot from work from home stuff too, right? I mean, where you see I, I think there was an even article today that I was reading. Maybe it was Wall Street Journal or New York Times or somewhere that was basically saying a lot of these CEOs who want their employees to come back to the office, they're wrong. They're not basing this on any data. They're, you know, kind of all over the place. And I was reading this and I couldn't help but wonder, and kind of some people might disagree with this, but the immediate thought that popped into my mind was like, who cares what you think? Like, this is the CEO of the company. You created a relationship where you agreed that you will contribute your ideas you will do a good job to service customers, to help employees, to do whatever it is that you need to do. The organization in turn will pay you. But like, when did it become a stigma to be in an office? Like, I, it, it's, it's mind boggling to me that we have to convince people to show up to work. And to me, it seems that there's a big disconnect between being productive versus growing. And sure, if you just have a to-do list, yeah, you can do that at home. You don't need to show up to an office. But I think the big mistake that a lot of people make is that we don't just want to be productive. We want to innovate. We want to come up with new ideas. We want to get better. We want to learn. We want to grow. And that's really hard to do when everybody's sitting behind a screen and you don't have that kind of collaboration. You don't have those kind of serendipitous moments of interaction. Like, how do you teach somebody to become a better leader and a better communicator when you're just behind a screen all the time? Like, it just, to me, and I don't know where you stand on the work from home debate, but to me, I think there needs to be a better balance of, sure, you don't need to be in the office every day from nine to five but you also can't just stay at home every day behind a computer. And a lot of these CEOs are not even being that unreasonable. They're saying, come into the office three days a week, right? Come into the office two days a week. And employees are so outraged with this. How dare you tell me to, and it just, it, it honestly, like I sometimes am left speechless, uh, speechless when I read these things. Uh, where do you stand on that debate? A few points. Uh, one, it actually makes me feel bad for the generation that's being lulled into complacency, thinking that this is a steady state somehow, yeah. or that sort of pseudo democracy will be perpetuated. Because like it or not, the one who runs the company will eventually dictate it. A lot of these policies were born of a of historically low unemployment, the lowest unemployment in 50 years, right? So obviously, the CEO, if they wanted to compete for talent, had to compromise. And uh, people will always choose more flexibility. I mean, who yeah. wouldn't, right? And, and higher quality of life. And so I think I'm, I am I less care because I'll run my company the way I want to that works best for my team, right? But I just think generally, I know who wins in the end. And I know that the economy is about to enter into a significant correction. I don't believe in anything that's being perpetuated that we're somehow going to, I think soft landing is a euphemism for soft pedaling. And the reality is we are going to see unemployment 
head north of five and a half, maybe even north of six percent, because that's how it always goes when the Fed tries to bring inflation down to two percent. So then you have to say to yourself, okay, CEOs are a lot of cases are calling employees back because they're trying to create the friction to weed out the people that aren't as committed, right? So yeah. I feel very, I feel. And it's because maybe young people listening and say, OK, Boomer. But I feel paternalistic for two reasons. One, do not be lulled into it because yeah. you're there selling you fool's gold. You have to do what it takes to protect yourself and your livelihood, number one. Number two, abdication is never the answer, right? Like if you hate your job, you should be loudly quitting. You know, at the end of the day, the, the, the path to be to be successful, and I don't think this has changed is to make yourself indispensable, whatever it is you're doing, and leverage that indispensability to get more responsibility. More responsibility is a leading indicator. Compensation is a lagging indicator. When you have leverage by virtue of making yourself indispensable on the new responsibility, you then go ahead and fight for yourself. Give me more money or I walk, right? Yeah. Like that is the sequence that will always be the sequence, right? Because the person in power <laughs> is hiring people to create a job to relieve themselves of a problem. And when you're indispensable, like, all right, Sally. All right, Dave. Like you're worth it. I will yeah. give you that ten. But you need to become. I think right? a lot of yeah. A lot of people forget you have to become indispensable first. Before. Yeah, and I think that is so. Like, I think a lot of the stuff we write about, and it's almost like uh, you know, you could see the mocking tone of the person who wrote the article, right? When they write about these phenomena, it's like they're temporary phenomena that are a reflection of two things: one, a stimulus of five trillion dollars that created uh, that created a dearth of people who wanted to work. Yep. And and uh, and two, and this is something to be empathetic about the emotional, heavy emotional friction of COVID. That's very confusing to a lot of people, right? I have the same thing, right? You know, during COVID, I was able to be around my kids more, and there's a lot of parts that I want to retain from that lifestyle, yeah. as does everybody. So we never had a national conversation like, "Hey, we all went through something very traumatic, and we broke the seal, but we overcorrected. We printed more money than any country on earth, and we kind of messed everything up, and we destroyed our cities." And we kind of need to come back to our cities to have viable cities. There's been no, no national imperative. Like, where's the Independence Day speech like at the end of the movie yep. where it's like, all right, everybody. Unfortunately, it's more fun to do scuba diving three days a week. But we got to go back to the cities because the, we have white elephants in San Francisco, New York and all over the country. And so that's a long way of answering that I feel actually focused on no matter what we think culturally or ethically, it's fool's gold and will not last. Yeah. And employees are pulling people back. So how do you run your team? I mean, obviously you have people who work with and for you. What's your work policy um, for your companies? And so at the time being, well, let's talk about me as the as the person. I wear so many different hats, right? I have this investment company, I have the book, I have TV. And so I have set up my life to make my life work wherever I need to be so I can be as efficient as possible. One of the frictions that's been now introduced or taken away rather is the long commute. So I'm like, my, my litmus test is how can Matt be most effective today and where will I be effective, right? And I design my any given day the way to be most effective, right? In terms of the overall staff, at the moment, we're, we're, uh, we're Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, which seems to work for everybody, makes people a lot happier. Mondays and Fridays, it's always a challenge to make sure like those are still work days, right? But I don't know, everyone, I've got a great team who are intrinsically motivated. They're all adults. They can be trusted. So it works for us. But I try to avoid rendering judgment on what might work for Google or Amazon. Yeah. Like we're an investment shop. We're not an operating company. Honestly, if this was an operating company, I would, I'm not sure that that schedule would work. I don't think it would. I think I would demand much more in-person interaction because these problems are real time. And like, but, but for an investment shop like we are, it does work. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned, uh, so you mentioned a couple interesting things that I thought we could dive a little bit deeper on. One is this idea of, um, you know, CEOs telling their employees to come into the office and it's the, you know, they want to see like who's going to put in the work, who's going to put in the time, who's going to uh, work harder. And for employees who are like, I'm not coming in, to your point, when the economy goes through a tough time, those are going to be the employees who are going to be let go first. So there's sort of the approach that the organization is taking. But one of the things that we don't talk about enough is the strategy that the individual needs to take for their career safety and for their, exactly. you know, taking care of themselves. And I get it. It might not be comfortable for you. It might not be ideal for you, but you also have to understand what's going on in the world. And that if you work for a company and you work for a leader or a CEO who's saying, Hey, come back into the office three days a week. And if you're going to be fighting that and saying, no, I don't want to do that. I'm going to protest. I'm going to be in these Slack channels and, you know, go after the company. 
Guess what's gonna happen when times get tough for the company? Guess who's gonna be let go first? It's gonna be everybody in that Slack channel who is saying, I don't wanna come into the office and I'm gonna work from home. You, those are gonna be the first people to go and everybody who's saying, you know what, I get it, I'm gonna come into the office, I know it's not ideal, I'm gonna do it anyway. Those are the people who are gonna end up staying in the organization. And it's funny, I, I put something up on LinkedIn and somebody left a comment and they're like, why would employees wanna work so hard and do all this work for an organization when the organization doesn't treat them well? And I, I'm sure you probably get some of those questions too, right? This idea of long-term loyalty is pretty much dead. So what's the balance there between how the organization treats the employees versus the commitment that employees need to make to the organization? Oh, such a tough, tough question. I mean, I do think as a leader, you have an obligation to always keep an eye on the person as an individual and not treat people as interchangeable cogs in a wheel, right? Like no one wants to feel that way. Yeah. And so I, I try to always stay, stay in a place where I think of this is somebody's son or daughter. Yeah. And what type of advice would I be wanting to give if I had that close of a relationship, right? Now, I'm not talking about hiring or firing decisions. I'm talking about even when I give my advice generally. I wrote an article as an example for CNBC, and this was the, the framework I had. And I said, the one question you don't want to ask on an interview right now is what's your work from home? Policy? I saw that. I saw that. And, and I love how mad everybody got. And I thought I wrote that article like if I was talking to my 20-year-old you know, son, this was the advice I'd be giving him individually. Like, hey, like you're trying to get that job, right? If you know that there's a decent chance that the CEO or whatever has a feeling of like, hey, I want people to work hard, especially when they're when the economy turns, right? Like it's just common sense. If you have a person who runs a company and the economy's turning, they're gonna be anxious as all hell and they're making really hard choices. So of course they wanna see people who are not overly concerned about their own needs. They're concerned about the company, right? So I try to give my advice when I talk about this to each person individually, like yeah. don't worry about the trend, worry about you. So back to, you know, generally as a leader, what's the balance between what does the company need? What is the, what is it? Well, first of all, if the company is full of a bunch of people who don't care about the company, the company won't be there to hire those people. So exactly. like, common sense, it's like there's a degree of working for the collective, but I think as a leader trying to strike the right balance, like empathy does go a long way, not as a bud word, bud word be like, all right, if you were doing a job and it showed no potential for promotion, you know, and it was drudgery, how would you feel? How would your child feel? Or if you were doing a job and you were trying to manage uh, being a caretaker at home or you're going through a divorce, how would you cope? You know, so I try to retain that, like heavy lies the crown, right? Like that's part of the job of being a leader. But at the, if you have full of, uh, if you have a company full of a bunch of people who are feeling like, why should I bother when you don't care about me? Look, at the end of the day though, they do have the power. Yep. Right. They may that power may be diminished in when times are are, are tight, uh, uh, when times are great because, you know, the labor shortage, but that'll change. And so I just my advice keeps being to publicly like think of yourself as an individual. What do you need to be successful? Don't worry about the overall trend. The topic of vulnerability is front and center inside of a lot of organizations today. But should you actually be vulnerable at work in my brand new book, Leading with Vulnerability? I actually say that you should not be vulnerable at work, but instead you should lead with vulnerability. The difference? Vulnerability is about exposing a gap, whereas leading with vulnerability is about exposing a gap that you have and then demonstrating what you are trying to do to close that gap. To figure out how to make all of this happen, I interviewed over 100 CEOs and surveyed 14,000 employees around the world. And I put all of that into my brand new book, which just came out. You can learn more by heading over to leadwithvulnerability.com. Yeah, I think there's uh, we've been a little bit short-sighted because during the pandemic, I think a lot of the power shifted into the hands of employees and a lot of employees. And this is coming from somebody who wrote a book on employee experience and has always been a big proponent on employees being treated well. But I saw the pendulum shift so much in the hands of employees that everybody, it was kind of like a you know, grab bag and just get as much as you can, get as much equity, get as much money, get a, you know, don't even show up to the office. And it swung so much that now the pendulum's starting to swing in the opposite direction. And I think a lot of people are having a hard time looking past six months, one year to two years, three years, right? I mean, you want to have that stability with a job, with an employer, 
not just focus on what's going on over the next few months. And I think that it just, just doesn't get talked about. And I don't know if it's trends on social media with TikTokers who are putting these ridiculous memes online that just drives me nuts. But you have to think about it from the well, perspective. Let's break, let's, break, let's, break down, let's break down why. Because I travel around a lot. I was in Singapore. I was in Japan. Yeah, yeah I was just in Singapore like, as well. It's total, totally different culture there. They work like crazy. Totally different culture. But everyone was like preserved their office culture because they knew, obviously, common sense. All you have to do to like analyze what happened to our country is to imagine if we hadn't um, injected five trillion dollars of stimulus under ERC credit bullshit programs and like stuff that a lot of which didn't hit the mark, right? It was just like free. We printed money, right? Yeah. Imagine we hadn't printed money. We would be sitting here talking about like how we just went through the hardest economic time in the history of this country. Millions of businesses went under. Jobs were destroyed, right? People had to do whatever it would take. There was no, there was no scuba diving, you know, or like there was no, there was no, you know, working for. It would have been a different world. But we injected five trillion of stimulus. So this is an entire fake reality that we have that has propped up around the fact that money was printed, and and, and it and it drove. What's crazy is it drove down unemployment, but also drove up inflation and created a yeah. prison of our own making that we now have to climb out of. Right. So all you have to do is remove and imagine what would have happened if the five trillion wasn't injected. But now imagine what happens now when it's removed. So the last is five hundred million dollars left in, in people's bank accounts. Uh, and that and that that tends to line up more in the middle class, right? It's been it's been um, it's been depleted, uh, depending on which socioeconomic bracket you are. But there's five hundred million dollars left in bank accounts, and that'll be drained by the end of December, right? And at the same time, student loan payments start October first, right? Uh, they're tolling for a month. When you take those combined factors, the entire world will now flip in uh, in in six months, six to nine months, right? And a lot of these conversations are going to seem passe and quaint. So my advice is like, get ahead of that. Skate to where the puck. Don't fight against whether this is true or not. Just use your common sense. Is that likely to happen? And how are employees likely to react when they are fighting for their own survival and there's no more stimulus money left to be printed? Hmm. And unemployment is increasing, right? Unemployment, there's always a lag between an increase in interest rates and, and how that affects employment. And this is the greatest, fastest uh, uh, increase of interest rates in the history of the country, right? In terms of uh, amount of time it was implemented. So we know what happens next. And so again, back to the point, whether we're going to debate it or not, or we should have a world in which no one needs to come to the office, we know what employers are going to do when they feel pinched, right? Yeah. And they're going to try to get as much as they can, much productivity as they can uh, out of the fewest number of people as possible. It just always happens that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I want to get back to this a little bit later in the show in the last like 10 or 15 minutes where we're going to talk about some action items. But I want to shift gears a little bit um, to talk about, uh, well, there are a few things that I thought were interesting um, in some of the interviews and things that I've seen that you've done. One, it seems like you had a full-blown panic attack or anxiety attack when you went on Shark Tank. And so I thought- Blasphemy. You could, what was it? Not terrible. No, I said blasphemy. Oh, I'm yeah. just kidding. I just, yeah, I don't know why I share that so publicly. And you know, every time somebody brings it up, I'm like, I should have just shut up about that. But no, but it's actually interesting. And I can relate to that because I also have experienced with a, a panic attack that actually came when I signed the contract to write a book that I have coming out in a few weeks on leading with vulnerability. And my panic attack came about because I was never a vulnerable person. My parents grew up from the uh, former USSR. And I was always taught, don't show emotion. Don't talk about feelings. Nobody cares about your problems. Just keep it all inside. And literally, I signed this contract to write a book talking about vulnerability. And my brain was just like, what did you just do? And shortly after I signed the contract, I had a full-blown panic attack. And it was terrifying for me. And I, I don't know what it felt like for you. For me, I thought I was having a heart attack and I was going to die. Uh, it was a completely terrifying experience. And it's funny because I was interviewing a lot of CEOs for this book and even a couple of CEOs that I interviewed told me that they have had panic attacks. They have experienced imposter syndrome. They have gone through very similar issues. But to your to what you just said, you're kind of like, oh, I wish I would have just shut up and not talked about it. But I think it's important to talk about these things, which is why I wanted to, uh, to ask you about that. Um, so can you yeah. share a little bit about the story and what happened? Did you learn anything from it? How did you get through that? And kind of tie that to imposter syndrome. Is that something that you've ever experienced as well? And how did you overcome that? Well, first of all, I'm kidding because <laughs> I have a I know, book. I know. So I, I meditated on whether I should share it or not. But uh, And the reason why I share the story I'm about to tell you is because I do think it's important uh, that people at the top model – you know, whatever the top means, or at least as aspirational jobs, they model that success happens in spite of more yeah. than because of. 
right? And so not because of your incredible talents, but in spite of your deficiencies, right? So when I was going on Shark Tank, and this would probably sound silly to anybody who's like, that's an amazing show. Why would you be stressed out? But for me, it was like stepping out of my comfort zone, never been on TV, totally gratuitous act to go on the show, performance anxiety, just like, but also feeling like, Everyone's going to see through this, you know, fake facade and see the kid who used to eat government cheese or sell flowers, right? Like, remember that? I, I remember back to my first girlfriend. Uh, her name was Sonia, actually. And her parents, like, lived in a wealthy house in Queens. And I remember how stressed I was about having to figure out which fork and spoon to use. I was like, what do you mean? There was so many forks. My house, we're lucky to have one clean fork. And they're usually plastic. Like, And I, I just, like, that's how Shark Tank felt for me. Like, are they going to see through this kid and see the one with no, uh, no upbringing, right? Anyway, so... I'm a terrible, I have a terrible insomniac. I'm always working on that. And my anxiety manifests in constantly perseverating on, you know, what's going to go wrong. I call it my inner catastrophizer, which I've learned to love and embrace. But I, uh, we can get into my process for it, for how I handle that. But anyway, I didn't sleep for 48 hours. And my sweet wife wakes up at, wow. you know, five in the morning with the alarm. Yep. No bullshit. So my wife wakes up and I took an Ambien the night before. Like literally two and days, no sleep. Two days no sleep and took an Ambien the night before. Wow. Um, and, and did not go to sleep. And so my wife wakes up at five in the morning and she's amazing. My wife's sour and she's like, All right, baby, you ready for the big day? And I was like, No, I didn't sleep at all. And I had been um, think, conjuring this idea that I was going to, I'm in a hotel. So I was like, What's credible? I was like, Okay, room service. I ordered salmon, made sure the, the menu had salmon. So they, in case they checked, this is how my mind goes crazy. And I was going to uh, tell them that Rohan Oza, who lived nearby, <laughs> Uh, I was going to call him to go take my spot. And so I tell my wife this. She's like, okay, honey, why don't you go into the shower? And, what, you know, to see how you feel afterwards. I'm sitting in the shower, all distraught. Now I'm distraught, like, how pathetic it is that I'm having this reaction to go on Shark Tank because it's, like, objectively should be a great moment. And um, and I remember thinking back to everything that I told you at the beginning of this podcast. saying like, I did not come this far and architect my whole life to be defeated by a TV show. Get your shit together. And no, no, there's videos of me doing this. This is no no exaggeration. I was like, I need to channel my 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 inner muse, like the poet Eminem, and listen to "Lose Yourself on a Loop," which I did. So this is me in the in the car, then me on the set. So I'll get to the point of the story though. I decided to, to talk to Damon John. Uh, and pull him into the dressing room because he lives in Queens, not far from totally different, obviously, but he's black. I'm white, different background, but grew up scrappy and working in a yeah. fast food like I did. And I could confide in him and I tell him, look, I don't know why, but I'm freaking out. I was like, and he's like, why? I said, because I don't know, man, feel like it's going to be obvious that uh, you know, I don't belong here. And he's like, first of all, F everyone else. They don't know what you came from nothing and I came from nothing. Like, give me that speech. But then he said something else. It was like Socrates, you know, going back in time. Very simple sentence. Uh, you belong here because you are here. Hmm. And, you know, I love that line for anyone who deals with imposter syndrome because what it tells you is there is no final arbiter of belonging. If you're in the room and you're at the table, you're there, that's it. You won and you don't need anyone else to validate you any further because you're there. And we tend to discredit the act action it took almost as fraudulent to get us where we are. I felt like it was fraudulent it was on Shark Tank because even though they had made the decision, I had done the work and I had, you know, run all these companies, I still felt because I could see myself at the center of those decisions influencing them that somehow it's fraudulent. And I, mm -hmm. anybody listening to this who's gotten on a board feels like they're out of depth. You know, it's funny. Women acknowledge this much more than men because yeah. men lie, right? Like – they know exactly what I'm talking about. Because you put yourself in the room, you oddly discount it. So there's a self-worth issue there, right? And you just have to accept that fact. And when I was on set, uh, I froze. <laughs> didn't care what David John, you know, the words didn't stick. And I started talking to myself in the third person at that moment, like, and gave that same speech. You've done all this stuff. You would, you know, you build companies. You're, you're, you're as credible as anybody here. And you belong here because you are here. Get your shit together. And then from that moment forward, it was about a minute and a half in, uh, the next 10 hours were some of the best of my life. And so I share that story because I care so much about self-awareness as a leadership principle, but we use that words and like, what does it really mean? And I get asked, well, Matt, how do you model self? How do you cultivate self-awareness in an organization? You do it the way I just did right now. I shared a story I didn't feel like sharing. It diminishes me in the eyes of some judgmental human listening to this right now, right? You would have seen the show and said, wow, you're a natural, but that doesn't do a service to anybody. 
I have now cultivated self-awareness amongst this audience because I have modeled vulnerability. The way you cultivate self-awareness is you share things that are risky, that diminish you, but are a gift to others. Because now anybody who watches that episode will be like, man, I remember that crazy story in a hotel room when he had salmon. And if he could get through it, I could get through it too. So mm. that's my imposter syndrome story. Yeah. And I love that you bring up vulnerability because one of the things that I talk about in, in my book is that inside of an organization, simply being vulnerable all the time is not good enough. In fact, simply yeah. being vulnerable all the time can actually come back to hurt you more times than it can help you. So instead of just simply being vulnerable, what a lot of people, again, especially in a work setting, want to know is that you're doing something to close the gap, that you're doing something to become more competent, that you're learning something, that you're growing. Because if you just show up to work every day and talk about, I don't know how to do this, I need help, you know, my dog ate my homework, like I'm in over my head, without- Yeah, that's not compelling. Exactly. So what you need to do with vulnerability is be vulnerable by all means, but also demonstrate what you're trying to do to get better, right? Um, I made a mistake, here's what I learned from it. I need help, here's what I'm doing, here are some steps that I'm taking to try to get better, to try to learn this. But especially if you're in a leadership role and you could probably relate to this, right? If you just kept coming into work and telling your employees, oh, I don't know about this, I don't know about that, I'm confused here, I'm stuck there. Eventually people are gonna look at you and say, hey Matt, um, you know, maybe you shouldn't be in this role because right. you seem to not know what you're doing. Uh, but instead, you talk about vulnerability, but you also bring in the level of leadership. Like, here's what I did. I talked to myself. I figured it out. I brought in Damon. Like, right, there's something, actions that you're doing demonstrating that you're closing that gap, which is why I love that story so much. Well, let's talk about that for a second because I, I, I talk to my wife about this topic all the time too, trying to identify that I, I'm compelled to – I love making a trajectory changing difference in someone's life who I've deemed is worth the time, because I think everybody makes subconscious calculate, are you worth the time? Uh, but where I where I get off the journey is when I've, we spent the energy, we worked on the issue, we've identified the solution, it's an objectively good solution, and then the person just regresses and revisits it. And then it's like, well, oh no, now you want me to rescue you, right? And so exactly what you said before, if you have vulnerability without iteration, you're someone in search of rescue yeah. and nobody wants to rescue anybody. Like we're all, not even that we're inherently selfish. We're on our own individual journey and we're just trying to eke out a little bit of joy in this universe. So people are constantly looking for one, being a victim or do looking for rescue. They eventually become fatiguing. So I agree with you within encapsulated with my story is a few things. One, it's a level of torture that anyone can relate to with the lack of sleep on an ambient. I still had to perform for 10 more hours. And then I went to dinner with Lori Grenier. Meanwhile, nobody's got the story that I'm completely depleted, right? I didn't tell Damon that I was asleep for, I was awake. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't want to voice that because then that would actually make me succumb. So, and I had to endure and still perform and iterate, right? Second no. time around, there was no imposter syndrome on Shark Tank, right? So I totally agree with you. Vulnerable, and here's the other thing I, I find so fake about our, our universe right now, especially Instagram. If you read my book, Burn the Boats, you'll see that there are moments of shocking vulnerability interspersed with, with achieving something and then a setback. And then it actually doesn't end very well, kind of ends sad the book because there are no guaranteed happy endings. And so like what I find, there's a rhythm on Instagram. There are these self-appointed gurus who tell you, and sometimes I feel like it's even manufactured vulnerability or stub stumbling, yes, yes. but I, I, ro I, I rose again and now I will share with you the answers to the test. And they they take the regression and they put it in the rearview mirror, right? And I think to be human is to progress and regress constantly. And so I say to this all the time, it's very important. I asterisk the shit out of my own book because my book is my accountability partner. Just because I've discerned some of the answers to the test doesn't mean I'm able to implement them all the time. And I think when when you have these gurus and people you know posting on Instagram and LinkedIn, whatever, if you don't go ahead and you don't share present day vulnerability, then you're actually you're you're perpetuating one a lie, but two, you're actually injuring the audience because they're like, wait, I never I can barely figure this shit out. <laughs> like I know I'm not, I know failure is good, but I'm still depressed as all hell. Just had two shots of tequila. Like I think it's really important for even at a, at my level, a leader to be like, I I still struggle to implement this book. Don't yeah. not believe that just because I've been able to articulate it very well and it's a bestseller that somehow, you know what I mean? And I, I know I'm going on a long thing, but I, it's one of the reasons why I wrote the book the way I wrote the book was like, I want to make sure that this is an act of commiseration, yep. not an act of lecturing people just because I'm supposedly successful and have authority. Yeah, but that's also part of the point, right? Is it's supposed to be hard. And I think a lot of people forget right. that 
especially if you aspire to be in a leadership role. And I've interviewed hundreds of CEOs, probably thousands over the years, and they all say it is a hard job. Sometimes it can be a lonely job. Sometimes you work harder than everybody else. You care more than everybody else, but that's what you sign up for. And I feel like there used to be this perception where once you get into a leadership role, it's supposed to be the cushy job, you work less, you got the parking spot, you got more money, and it's supposed to be easy. But the reality is that those are the jobs that are harder than any other job at the company. In fact, if you want it to be easier, stay in your individual contributor role, especially in a big company where you can remain anonymous, nobody knows who you are, and you kind of float by. But once you get into that leadership role where you're responsible for others, you're responsible for a team, that's when it becomes hard. And people need to understand and accept that if that's the path that you want to go on, it becomes harder, not easier. You will get out of your comfort zone. You're going to get pushed. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to have challenges. And for some reason, I don't know where that message got lost in the corporate world, but I, and this is why I wanted to ask you about some of your challenges, right? It needs to be talked about more because it's not easy. Yeah. And I think funny you said that it probably was the time when there was the martini lunch and parking spot and yes, like where exactly. when you were at that level, when you arrived at that level, there was a degree of like, well, now here are the trappings and obviously that's gone. Uh, but I think the bigger issue is like success is very hard and painful yeah. and there is no, there's no, there's no destination, you know, there's no like declaring, but there are different, which is why it's so important to be very intentional for you to define what success looks like. I know it sounds corny, but yeah. I meditate a lot. And I really work harder and harder to hold on to it because I think success becomes its own prison because you don't you don't want to compromise the trappings of it, right? You don't want to compromise reputation by taking risks. You don't want to quit your job because you have a great salary. So like it's very important for me to meditate on defining my own definition of success and making it as narrow as possible and making my needs as narrow as possible so I'm willing to take risk. So I think the bottom line, it's not just like being a CEO that is hard and grueling. It's being a successful human yep. who is aspiring and failing and stumbling and resuming again that is very, very – you know, difficult. And I do think there's more entitlement in our society now than ever before. Yeah. Like that is probably the thing. I hope that changes because entitlement culture is just, um, again, fool's gold too, right? It doesn't lead to anything. No one's just going to give you things, even if they give it to you in the moment. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I mean, especially, like I said, my parents came from the former USSR. So there was very uh, little of that mentality in, in my house. And it almost seems like, and I believe you, you're Irish, right? You have Irish descent. Um, yeah, I have Irish yeah, and it seems to me that a lot of kids of immigrant families are, it's easier for them to embrace that mindset because they hear stories growing up of how difficult it was and how their families had to struggle. And, you know, and my parents used to tell me these stories all the time. And so I grew up with that mentality of, well, shit, like, if I don't work hard, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to get anything. And so the immigrant mentality, I think, is actually one that is very useful, very beneficial, very powerful for a lot of us to kind of remember. It just seems like immigrants are scrappier, they're more resourceful, they, I don't know, it's different. And people who come from immigrant families know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, and I think in my case, for me, I think the most important thing that I have done in terms of setting culture of my own family and my own little ecosystem is making sure that um, the trappings of wealth is not where anyone derives their self-worth, yes. you know, or self-esteem, which starts with me. Like, yeah. it's so, cliche so silly like why would i think a nice car or anything matters what they what we value is the is the um is the byproduct of work hard work yeah the creativity of making advance uh, investments ahead of evidence and how how amazing that feels to be right and convicted and act on it and i try to actually pull back the curtain on my decision making i'm sure ad nauseum according to everyone in my family but i really show them how the sausage is made yep you know the fact pattern I had to do how I had to decide it, but I, I, people ask all the time, well, how do you, how do you make sure that, cause your kids grow up so differently than you did, you know, that they have good values. And I was like, I actually think it's not hard at all. Like it starts with them with modeling your own self-worth, self-esteem, not being der derived from material assets, but being derived from the, the beauty of hard work and what it produces. And yep. so, uh, I, I think people who try to deny their kids, like, the benefits of the the world that they've created is sort of a waste of energy. It's not going to work. It's really modeling uh, yeah. your values. Uh, okay. So for the last uh, 15 minutes or so, I wanted to dive into more of kind of the action item. You talked about process, um, you know, how you do big things, how you achieve goals. So I really wanted to focus on that for the remaining time. 
Uh, and maybe we could start. So there are a few different processes it seems like you've mentioned. One was the process and kind of how you overcame that imposter syndrome. Another process is how you think of big ideas and how you achieve goals. And then I also wanted to touch on what you would do if you were an employee in today's corporate environment, maybe a mid-level employee inside of an organization, you see what's going on in the current economic climate. What can you do to help ensure that you will not get fired, that you will stay relevant, that you will have a job over the coming years? So let's start off with the imposter syndrome piece. What did you do to overcome kind of the panic, anxiety, imposter syndrome piece? My conversation with Matt Higgins continues and in the bonus episode for subscribers of Great Leadership Plus, we're gonna specifically talk about the process that he uses for doing big things and achieving goals. So we're gonna do a little bit of a deeper dive into that. Specifically, we're gonna talk about things like imposter syndrome, uh, embracing anxiety and committing to goals, and what to do when you don't meet a goal, when you experience a failure. How do you overcome those challenges, those fears, and those failures to achieve your goals? And we're gonna wrap up this bonus conversation by talking about career success and personal growth. So if you wanna get access to that bonus episode, uh, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts to Great Leadership Plus. And if you wanna join the community and get access to in-depth weekly articles that I write, as well as short leadership hacks, you can head over to greatleadership.substack.com. We have over 40,000 members there now. And lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend, a coworker, a peer, somebody who you would like to see become a better leader. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time.